Hello, everybody. I'm Graham Young, and I'm here with... Rob Schulte. And Rob, where are we at today? New York City. Graham, I'm so glad you're here. Yes, uh, I decided to take a road trip for the summer. I I had a little bit of time off work. It was very surprising, Graham. I did not know that you owned, like, a convertible El Camino. Yes. Um, I, I am, I am, the giant horns on the front. I am one of only three people in Austin uh, that wow. has that. The other one, unfortunately, is Ted Cruz. <laughs> <laughs> but we, well, won't, I, we won't digress into that. But Rob, thank you so much for having me in New York City. I promise next time I will let you know before I show up. Uh, at your yeah, front door. A little, just a little bit. A little bit of notice. Would be great. <laughs> Graham, so I, I think one of the things before we do anything else, we, we welcome the audience. We say maybe you're listening to us for the first time. Usually we have episodes that are out in the autumn, uh, but it's a lot of fun doing an out of season app, don't you think? Oh, yeah. I mean, up until about a couple of months ago, we thought the only season was. Uh, you know, the fall, Halloween. But we're starting to expand into um, other times of the year. I've got my toe in the pool. Yes. Uh, Here in Brooklyn, New York. And since we're in Brooklyn, I thought it would be appropriate to talk about some classic New York City slasher films. Oh, it's great. So, this episode, we watched... Maniac Cop. Uh, by the great William Lustig. Uh, what, yes. What am I, uh, this guy is great. Um, I think over half of his films have Maniac in the title. But Maniac Cop, um, I always thought, was a pretty groovy film. Graham, i got to ask you a question, though. And this is um, a, a, a film question that I think only you and uh, fans of film of your stature could, could make clear to me. And I need a little help on something, okay? Okay. When you refer to someone's film... Is it always the director? Yes, but uh, being a uh, hack filmmaker myself, um, I know that it it's it, it takes a village, right? Sure, but I, I'm just wondering, like, at what point is it writer versus director or director, right? You know what I mean? Because like, when you look at Lustig's uh, film career, yes, there's a lot of maniacs in there, and then you look at Larry Cohen's who wrote it. And there's also a bunch of maniacs, but then, like, this long list of crazy grindhouse films, essentially. Yeah, Larry Cohen is a genius, uh, and we'll get into him. So, the, formally, it's the director's film. That's what I tend to do. Um, I mean, that's what I've always done myself, too. I was just thinking about it, you know, switching between these two IMDb tabs that I have open. <laughs> and... <laughs> You know, because I guess it is like the director takes it and creates what they want from a script. True. I, I mean, well, the, the director is the ultimate creative captain of the ship, if you will. Absolutely. He wears the Russell Crowe hats. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, I, I remember watching an interview with David Fincher, and he was saying that he's kind of a control freak on set. Um, you don't I, say. I, I'm paraphrasing, of course. And he said something to the extent of, when it's my name on the film because I'm the director, we'll say a David Fincher film. And that's who gets the blame if it's a bad movie, and that's who gets the praise if it's a good film. So, yeah, I, I always stick with the, the director sort of um, taking either the praise or the, um, or the, uh, the shame of the, uh, yeah, for making such that makes a, a sense. film. So. I now believe my husband may be doing these murders. Is that why you followed her? Is that why you shut her up for That's her? not true. You got an alibi for last Wednesday night, the preceding Friday, huh? I was home. Well, come on, Forrest. If you were home, your wife would not have suspected you. Maniac Cop. Tagline, you have the right to remain silent forever. I think that's possibly like one of my favorite taglines uh, <laughs> from, so the, from the 80s horror uh, genre. The, the title itself, Maniac Cop, um, producers were like it – was, it was almost like RoboCop. Producers were totally against it until they released it and they had great success with it. And they were like, oh, well, we were wrong. Uh, sort of alluding to the fact that there may be some cops in New York City that are <laughs> uh, a little uh, kooky, shall we say. But not all. And um, 
Uh, Rob, uh, before we get into the plot, what were your just initial? What was your initial reaction to the film? Whenever I see like a low budget '80s movie, or it doesn't even really have to be low budget, but any sort of movie before like 1994, they always just feel so real. It's like this is a situation I could put. It felt like tactile, you know. This knows what it's doing, but it's also low budget enough that I feel like I'm on the street with these people. I, that's why I kind of thought this would be a great idea for um, a New York City movie because I think it just really represent, uh, represents the city well. Yeah, I think it does. I also noticed a lot of things in the city that I don't think if I would have watched this a few years ago, I would have got. At the same time, I was watching the movie The Siege uh from 1995 i believe okay yeah and that is shot in brooklyn as well but uh they took like a, i believe it was a polish neighborhood and doctored it up to be like a middle eastern neighborhood and so it's very interesting like i i heard that i i didn't know about the neighborhoods this was something a friend told me about it oh but uh, it's weird to see new york and these different like vantage points and especially eras Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, 1980s New York City um, sort of has that kind of vibe, especially when you watch films, um, especially uh, independent films. Um, I think 1981 was the most violent year in New York City history. So Maniac Cop coming out in the wake of that um, was maybe a, uh, a statement by uh, Lustig. Um, yeah, well, what was it, 88? So it's yeah. like, I had the, he probably had the idea in like 82. Yeah, and then and the producers heard the name Maniac Cop and they were like, pass. They were like, <laughs> uh, why don't we first make one that's just called Maniac, okay? And yeah, then see how good that does. We'll test the waters right. with that. And actually, Maniac was um, a lot more controversial uh, than That's what I hear, Maniac but I've, I don't know it, so... Uh, for those who don't know, Maniac is about uh, a serial killer, and it stars Joe Spinell. Maniac, you can lock your doors, but you can't lock the madman. Out of your mind. Maniac is about a uh, killer on the loose in New York City, played by Joe Spinell, who um, people may recognize from The Godfather. Who was he in The Godfather? Um, he was one of the assassins during the montage assassinations during Michael's christen his his kids' christening. Gotcha, gotcha. Graham, that's a this is a good a time as any to uh, give the people the an IMDb storyline update of just Maniac Cop. From the vantage point of a fan of IMDb. But this one comes with a bit of a twist. Are you ready? Oh, I, I, I hope. <laughs> okay. Innocent people are being brutally murdered on the streets of New York City by a uniformed police officer. As the death toll rises and City Hall attempts a cover-up, Frank McRae heads to an investigation. A young cop, Jack Forrest, finds himself under arrest as the chief suspect, having been the victim of a setup by the serial killer and a mysterious woman phone caller. Forrest, his girlfriend Teresa, and McRae set out to solve the puzzle before the maniac cop can strike again. Twist, written by John Barrymore. Do you think John wrote this while on break of the set of Svengali? Um, yes. Uh, during the writer's strike, he worked on <laughs> Maniac Cop. Because <laughs> no one gave a shit about that at the time. But of course, now it's, re it's considered a classic. I was Captain Ahab. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, obviously, that is not a, uh, the same John Barrymore we are talking about. As someone with a similar name of a dead Hollywood uh, human being actor. Anyway, <laughs> Graham. I like how you this, play human being before actor. Like, let's forget. <laughs> let's not forget that we're all human here. I, I we are yeah. all human beings. This movie spawned a couple of sequels that maybe, hey, we're going to watch those as the days go on this summer. Um, but this movie was actually re a limited release on the same day as Friday the 13th, Part 7. Oh, was it really? Okay. Which New Blood, it'd be hard to say which one of these films I like more. I, you don't have to say you like one more than the other, but it does seem to be like uh, people might flock more to what they know. True. Um, let's just be positive and say what an amazing double feature for anyone who took advantage of that. 
That actually would be. Can you imagine that night? Like, it's 1988. You get to plan out your evenings. It's not like at any point in time you have a cell phone that someone can be like, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? And bothering you. You can just be like, I'm going to go see. You know what, Graham? Let's uh, set up a scenario. Okay. okay. We are at work on Monday, and someone's, you know, you're at the coffee station. Day's getting started. And I come up to you, and you had gone to this double feature, okay, on Saturday. Oh, uh, hey, Graham. Um, man, Mondays. Ugh, I didn't even do anything this weekend. Did you have anything go on? Uh, well, yeah, but I don't know if it'd be anything you're interested in. Oh, you've you've piqued my interest. Uh, nah, just forget it, man. Just forget. Well, it. No, what was it? What'd you do? Did you travel? Uh, I traveled to the theater. Oh, really? Would you call yourself an auteur? Uh, well, I, I would call myself a, an aficionado, an aficionado of great New York City cinema. I dot my cap to you, sir. What what films did you see? And do you recommend? Uh, uh, yes, absolutely. I saw the uh, what is soon to be classic Maniac Cop Two. Um, keep it two mi- keep Maniac. I, I'm Cop sorry, two? sorry, sorry. I saw Maniac Cop. Um, Maniac and keep Cop. in mind, this is 1988. I had lots of choices when I went to the theater. Um, I could have watched uh, Beetlejuice. I think Beetlejuice came out in 88. Yeah, I could have watched Beetlejuice, but instead I saw Maniac Cop. That wasn't. I wasn't finished there. Oh really? No, 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 no. I stuck around, and uh, when the usher wasn't looking, I got a two for one and went into the theater and watched uh, Friday the Thirteenth Part Seven. Oh man, let's do it again this weekend and scene. <laughs> yeah, wow. yeah. Graham, that is. I love that feeling, though. You know what I mean? Like, the idea of being able to just, like, I'm going to sneak into the movies, and I'll be spending my entire evening at the movies. What's the last movie that you snuck in? You did not, you did not pay for this movie. You just went in and watched it. Oh, man. I know the first one I did, but I don't remember the last time I actually did it. Um, I guess I snuck into some Liberty Hall movies, but that was kind of like... no. Well, you worked there, so yeah. I mean, yeah, that's... Yeah. You rebel. Uh, but... The first movie I snuck into was The Beverly Hillbillies after my dad was late to taking us to A Nightmare uh, nightmare Before Christmas. Uh, afterwards, he goes, hey, let's sneak into this one. And we watched The Beverly Hillbillies. And you learned your lesson and you never snuck into another movie I guess again. so. I've yeah. blocked out every movie <laughs> since that I snuck into. Good Lord. I think, on, in all honesty, the last film that I had to sneak into a theater to watch uh, was Enemy of the State. Oh, man. With Will Smith and Gene Hackman. And the only reason I didn't pay for a ticket, I would have gladly paid for it, but in Kansas, if you were under the age of 17, um, they treated it like an X. You could not get in. They treated it like it was a law. Yeah, I mean... (laughs) Which it's not. One of these days, Rob, we'll do a we'll do a episode about the uh, rating system in America. One of these days. One of these days. So back in it, this movie did not do well in the box office, Graham. Well, it it wasn't released in that many theaters, and that was the problem. Yeah, it was very very limited. It was it was a success if you want to like keep in mind the, the the number of theaters that it was released in, but again. With a title like Maniac Cop, they got really spooked before release date, and it wasn't released in as many theaters as it should have been, and I think that is the reason why it's not successful. Well, and this was a non-union film too, right? So there was like pushback from Teamsters yeah. in New York. and Most of Larry Cohen's movies and William Lustig's movies are, are, are non-union. And does that just mean union workers are angry and so they'll... Do something to sabotage your film. Well, I'm not saying like one way or the other. I just yeah didn't know if he actually deliberately did something like threw rocks at their house. You're or, you're just curious. No, the, yeah. I I actually have an answer for you. Oh uh, please. Um. So the Teamsters would shine bright lights during yeah. during night scenes on the location, and they would also shine lights into the camera, which would really screw it up. You know, you weren't able to get your shots and. 
And, and they just did that because it was a non-union film. Yes. Aha. Uh-huh. And they also ha- took the muffler off of a Harley Davidson. So for the indoor scenes at Maniac Cop, they'd have a guy circle the block. Um, and and just caused <laughs> noise so they couldn't film. And eventually Larry Cohen did work out a deal with the Teamsters. I don't know to what extent, um, but they were able to complete the movie. So Well, that's good. Uh, people need to be paid a living wage. Yes. Uh, <laughs> no, I think people should be taken advantage of by the uh, uh, millionaires in Hollywood and, and New York. Uh, I am all for that. You know, uh, Texas is not a union state, but that, again, another story. We'll, we'll get to that uh, eventually, Rob. We'll get to a lot of things. Officer Mallory, 33rd Precinct, Vice Squad. What makes this movie important to you? Well, I think first and foremost, it's a time capsule of, of New York City, a certain place, a certain time. I think it represents that time and place so well. Um, but also, I think there's um, some dynamite actors in this film. Um for those who don't know, it stars Bruce Campbell. Um, most of y'all will probably know him from Evil Dead. Um, but this Rob, he actually considers the worst film he's ever made. And this is coming after he made Congo and Mikhail's Navy. Wow. <laughs> so just wrap your mind around that. And um, Bruce, if you're listening, you're probably not... Please go back and look at this film with an open mind. I think I think you'll be impressed not only by the film, but your performance. It's great. Graham, I, I'm right there with you. This is obviously my first time watching it since you had suggested it to me. And being able to like both be in New York right now and look at what um, a movie like this represents as a time capsule, but really like... What story was actually being told here? Was it that no matter what, there's going to be an authoritarian police presence that you never quite know what they're up to? Or is it just like slash having fun 80s gore? You know, let's see what we can do with a crazy cop that's kind of a zombie but also knows how to drive a car. The latter is probably untrue because I think Larry Cohen and and Lustig are – more intelligent than I mean their films are slasher films but it's a, it's a stage to present a bigger story we've talked about this before um, but certainly uh, uh, a civil untrust of the uh, of the New York City police um, of course there were several corruption cases in the 1980s uh, the documentary the seven five goes into that if you want to if you want to watch a good documentary about police corruption in the 1980s but um, also, Rob, um, I love the themes of the of the protagonist and in, in, or sort of what the story that Lustig is telling, I should say, with the protagonist and the antagonist. Um, I love Bruce Campbell's character because he's a flawed character. In fact, we, you know, we see him cheating on his wife. Yeah, and, for sure. And then he's so guilt ridden for the rest of the movie, and he's like almost obsessed in trying to make that right. Um, it makes for a really compelling character, in my opinion. I completely agree. And then I like on the same level that, like, the maniac cop could be a, f- you know, flawed character as well, being a good police officer that is now put in a position that just, like, kills whatever it wants. Yeah. You know? And he was he was screwed over and killed in Sing yeah. Sing. And just that, I, I think that Lustig... And, and Cohen are showing some real dimensions to uh, what otherwise could have been like cardboard cutout characters. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it's really intelligent filmmaking, both like uh, the actual filmmaking, but uh, also in, in the storytelling. Um, this is, um, I don't think it's the, the greatest horror film of the 1980s, but I do think it's a standout one. And I think it's one... Um, just wait till you hear, hear what I have to say about number two, because I think, uh, spoiler alert, I think number two is one of the best uh, sequels ever made. But the first one, I think, stands on its own um, as just being a really solid uh, story. And one of the, the things I also liked, I don't mean to, to drag on here, Rob, the whole first act that everyone in New York City is paranoid of police officers 
and that innocent police officers are, are being shot by civilians. Yeah. And that whole paranoia, I love it. I, I, I mean, oh, yeah. I love it. I, I really, you could cut the tension with a, with a knife, man. I mean, it, it, I. Well, and the fact that they also made it frightening to see this cop during many daytime scenes. Oh, yeah. Like, felt a lot like Halloween. Oh, Rob, I think you're onto something there. I think you're absolutely right. And I think we should just stop and take a moment and uh, mention that Laureen Landon, although she hasn't done uh, the top films in the world, she, she's pretty convincing and fun in this movie. She's amazing. And, um, Rob, there's a little uh, scene with her. I don't know if you uh, noticed this. Um, she's holding up a police badge. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's upside down, and yeah. and uh, they actually that was the only take they had of that, so they had to use it. But I just think it's I think that little uh, tidbit is is wonderful. But no, she's amazing. Um, and we should also mention uh, Robert Zadar, uh, Robert Zadar, the maniac cop. Uh, Robert passed away in 2015. Uh, rest in peace. Uh, I think he was a phenomenal actor. I've I've watched several films with Robert. Um, probably my favorite being Samurai Cop. Um, he also was in Killing American Style, and um, his probably his most like Hollywood film was uh, Rob. Actually, I think it's one of your favorites, Tango and Cash. Oh yeah, 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 yeah <laughs> you know. right up there. Um, but if you've never seen a picture of Robert Zadar, you should really check him out. He's got like this. I mean, if you think Bruce Campbell has this incredible <laughs> chin, no, 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 no. It's like they they found the guys with the most magnificent chins, Robert Zadar and Bruce Campbell, and and oh, Robert Zadar's man. chin, like, could kill you if you got too close to it. <laughs> that thing was dangerous. It is. Oh, it's deadly. Actually, he's killing everybody. As we start to wrap up, I want to read this IMDb review uh, titled Low Budget and Awesome. Okay, I love it. Get ready. This review was written almost a decade ago. Let's just put that out there. It was written in 99 in January. So it'd be almost 20 years. Yeah, that's what I meant. It'll be almost 20 years old. Yes. Um, Two decades. Jesus Christ. No, uh, dude, listen, don't ever be ashamed about those simple mistakes because just know that Graham T. Young does it for a living. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maniac Cop is a great exploitation film. It has some truly inspired moments. Bruce Campbell is great, and, and the Maniac Cop himself is a worthy creation in a horror genre. Most people will avoid this, and they shouldn't. Because for the budget and its limitations, it's a great flick. Fix a nice big bowl of popcorn and enjoy a great horror cheapie. You know what? Spot on. Yeah, I mean, we've actually got some really good reviews today. Yeah, I mean, uh, someone gave the storyline short and succinct, probably because they're Hollywood, you know, famous. But uh, this review, right on the money and 20 years old. I'm hoping that he continued his... Uh, reviews. Uh, yeah. Maybe. We, well, we, we can take a look. Find some recent uh, but, ones from him, possibly. Yeah. Oh, man. that That's a good idea. Let's take a look at that later. Uh, we'll now, put Graham, both of them in our Hall of Fame, as far as reviews go. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Graham, before we wrap up, though, I think we should talk about this upcoming autumn season, which... Just to fully announce, we're, if you haven't seen, we're going to be reviewing the Child's Play series. That also means all the Chucky movies. So, yes. Bride, Seed, Curse, Cult. That's right. Rob and I are masochists, and we sat down <laughs> and watched all seven of the Chucky films. So, stay tuned for that. Um, I think a lot of what you'll hear uh, will probably shock you to your very core. Now, Graham... I'm going to warn people that there's one episode that we got into and you couldn't even finish the film. Yeah. And there's a talking point I want to get to here and we can keep it short and sweet, but like without like you'll hear exactly why on the episode, but uh, to lead up to that, what would you say is the difference between watching like a bad B movie and the reason why you decided not to watch the movie in question? Well, 
to quote Joe Bob Briggs, the immortal Joe Bob Briggs, you know, someone once asked him, you know, why, what makes a good B-movie? Well, a good B-movie has everything uh, that a great Hollywood film has, except they've done it with a cheaper budget and with not as many tools in the toolbox, per se. I think with that being said, it was a lot of fun, and I think people are going to really enjoy this this third year that we've been doing the podcast. That's true. Um, Isn't that crazy? That's so nuts. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. Just to think, like three years ago, I was 57, and now I'm hitting almost <laughs> 60. It's insane. So uh, there's been a little bit of Chucky news, though, that I think we're going to have to address now before that season comes up. Can you tell me anything about this TV show that was supposed to... Um, uh, I could probably supposed to be made. Well, it is in production. I can't remember. I think it's. I don't. I don't even want to say because I'll, I'll probably get it wrong. But um, it is coming. It is greenlit. There's going to be a Chucky television show uh, created by Don Mancini. So he's he's sticking in there for the long haul. Um, I mean, he's married to this franchise. I mean, he's been with it since. Movie one. Hey man, it it is it is like a classic job. You know, I know how to do this. They're not going to fire me. Sure, bring it on. I love a paycheck, Ch- and I don't mean that in a negative way. Chucky I mean pays like, the bills, man. Yeah, I can only tell you one thing for sure. I probably won't watch that. But Rob and I will might do a follow up series discussing the show. You never know. I will probably watch it because. I like uh, putting myself through situations like that. You know what? I want the new Chucky television series to be called Chucky, What About Fiona? (laughs) What (laughs) happened? Is she in the show? Because I have to say, she brought a lot of life to a series that I thought was dead after uh, Seed of Chucky. But we'll get into that with the new series. Uh, This Nerdist article says that... uh, According to Bloody Disgusting, Brad Dourif will be back as the voice of Chucky. The show will be eight hour long episodes to start with, and it will be within existing canon and not a reboot. There was a sequel announced to Cult of Chucky last year, but will this new television series be in addition to that movie, or will it just replace it entirely? It's all a big unknown at this point as is just which network uh, this sh- new show will s- is supposed to land on. So, we don't really know anything. And that article was from June 23rd, 2018. So, it's a little old. There might be a little bit new info. but So, eh. the news is we know nothing. Yeah, a- at least as of the end of June, we knew nothing about it, except that it's happening, Don Mancini's attached, and... Brad Dourif is. So I'm sure Fiona is as well. That's a great lineup, but not as good as Larry Cohen and William Lustig. So let's journey further next week, Rob, into the warped mind of the Maniac Cop 2. And there's going to be a Maniac Cop uh, remake on December 1st, 2018. You're kidding me. I didn't know that. Really? <laughs>